Welcome back, welcome back to the Sunday Wire today, Sunday 15th of June 2015. Sounds like a date from the future. This is me, Basil Valentine, sitting in for Patrick Henningsen with a bad head cold. Patrick is away this week. He'll be back next week. Um, if you were listening just before the break, or even if you weren't, I'd be breaking down an excellent article in The Ecologist by Paul Mobbs. Behind the Magna Carta spin, Britain's dictatorship of the 1% is taking shape, detailing the various aspects in which, the various ways in which the rights and freedom of the British people are being quite deliberately corrupted by the present government in favour of the state. Um, and I know that that's a subject very dear to the heart of my guest, Tony Gosling, who joins me now from Bristol. Good afternoon, Tony. Hi, Basil. Uh, great to have you with us. Um, can I ask you, why do you think it is that this particularly pernicious government, who claim to be conservative, I mean, I think, we, could, we as I said before the break, I think we'd stand a good chance of holding them up under the Trade Descriptions Act as conservatives, because they don't want to conserve anything. They don't want to conserve the countryside, they want to build all over it or frack it. They don't want to conserve democracy. They don't want to conserve the health service. They don't want to conserve a thing. They're iconoclasts. Uh, and at the moment, they're taking a, a great axe to the civil liberties, many of which we have enjoyed, or at least felt we have benefited from for the last 800 years, perhaps the foremost being access to the courts and to justice. But they seem determined to restrict that to ordinary people. Why on earth do you think that is? Well, I think you're exaggerating to say we've had access for 800 years. I think if you were to talk to someone, say, for example, during the English Civil War uh, in, in the mid-1600s, uh, they would say they didn't have any access to the legal system or the courts. I mean, legal aid and the entire welfare state, the, the idea that, uh, uh, that, that the state should be there um, to stop anybody in the country falling be below minimum standards of health and um, poverty, uh, that's what's going out of the window. And that was what was brought in by the Acne government after the Second World War. And, and it, I think really it's that system which is being smashed now. Um, uh, and I, I mean, the Magna Carta, in a way, uh, I mean, for example, during the, during the uh, English Civil War, which I've looked into quite a lot, um, when I was living in Oxford, it, the Magna Carta was talked about in the English Civil, Civil War, Magna Carta, Magna Fata, because it wasn't worth, they didn't think it was worth uh, the paper it was written on, because, it, you know, the, the civil liberties that were supposedly guaranteed just simply weren't being delivered. And, and you know, that really what's going on now, I think, is, in a, is, is a sort of re-imposition of the feudal system uh, at, under a kind of corporate guise, as we got really with the Industrial Revolution. I mean, if you want to look at all this in historical perspective, it's really to do with the disenfranchisement from, uh, by, you know, by the merchant classes of the peasant class in Britain. Uh, sorry about that, folks. Uh, ghost in the machine. Um, back to Tony. Yeah, you were saying it's a sort of what we're witnessing now is a sort of a reimposition of the feudalism under the corporate guys. It is, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's essentially, there was a, a, a battle between the various different types of ruling classes in the mid 1600s here in Britain, and uh, you know that, that was when the merchant classes, the banking classes, took over the running of the country, the mercantile lot from the uh, traditional feudal uh, system, the feudal class, the landowners. Where you had a mass evictions, a really privatisation of land or enclosure really accelerated after the Civil War and that's why I think I mean it's pretty clear, that's why the Industrial Revolution happened in Britain, it's not because we just happened to be really smart with inventing, you know, James Watt inventing the steam engine and all that kind of thing it was because we had this massive pool of hapless ex- countryside rural labourers who had no land anymore and so they were it was easy to get them to work for peanuts in factories and, and that's what yeah that's that was the first thing that I mean Britain was the first country in the world to go for mass urbanisation and it's why when you go through the countryside now often you can drive or go on the train for miles and see hardly any houses at all but uh, you know, our countryside is very very depopulated uh, and that's why we're in that situation in the English Civil War I mean I looked up and I've got a lot of 
the stuff about this in um, in the Bodleian Library when I was living in Oxford, and and there was the people were poking fun at the Magna Carta, saying, well, it isn't worth the paper it's written on. I mean, I think actually to a certain extent, you know, it is obviously civil liberty is very important, which is why the Conservatives want to get rid of the Human Rights Act and the reference to the European Court of Human Rights because there's all sorts of infringements of human rights going on in Britain, and they want to be able to carry on with that, not least of which is the um, the uh, sexual abuse of children and uh, and murder even of children. All these sorts of treatment um, and basically driving people into abject poverty, total starvation, etc., are infringements of their human rights. And let's not forget that was one of the biggest settlements that came after the Second World War alongside uh, the United Nations uh, what was the Universal Declaration of Human Rights? These very basic things were said to be, you know, these are absolutely the bare minimum that we can expect from decent civilised nations, and that's what the Conservatives want to smash right now. Right. Uh, you hit upon another point, which um, I think we've completely forgotten. Oh. As you said, with the enclosures in the 1800s, um, a lot of peasants were rendered landless. Well, it's mainly actually the 1700s, because the English Civil War was, took place in the 1640s, uh, and it was after then that the Bank of England was chartered, uh, you know, this uh, private monopoly, actually, of, uh, of, the, of, the, of uh, printed money in Britain, and also after that, that these uh, uh, privatisation of land, uh, the individual enclosures of villages really accelerated in the 100 and 150 years or so after the Civil War, so it's mainly the 1700s that was going on. By the Victorian era, it had been mostly complete, so... Yeah, that's why the Victorian era was so much the sort of heart of the Industrial Revolution is because you had all these poor people and families that had been working the land for centuries had been just kicked off and so they had to find some work in the factories. A lot of them, of course, were used, put on ships and sent abroad. A lot, a lot you know, the, for example, the Irish were starved out, the Scots were starved out in the Highland clearances and um, sent across to colonise America. Um, am I right in saying that the original concept of the dole was a payment by the government to the landless peasant? It wasn't. No, it wasn't. The dole was never actually. I mean, I mean, I looked into this in the um, in the library in Oxford when I was down there. I went back through because the word dole. I wanted to find out. I would get a satisfactory answer as to where it was because we. I was on the dole at the time, you know, and I wanted to find out where has this come from. This word, and the definition was it was a part or portion, most commonly of a meadow where several persons have shares, and that means it was land, effectively. And the same, if you go back to medieval times with the knights, the knights had to pay a fee, and a fee wasn't money, it was land. So it was service in exchange for land. Uh, and no money was be, would be changing hands, basically. The knight had to do a certain number of weeks a year service for the lord of the manor, his lord, uh, and, uh, and it was called the fee. So, you know, there's a whole load of uh, history really around originally people giving time to their feudal betters now uh, and in the capitalist post civil war English civil war world it's money you know it was all changed over to money and in fact Britain survived I mean okay the, the iron age is not perfect but we did, didn't really use money until the Roman invasion though originally land the concept of dole was in, turned into money uh, with the foundation of the welfare state, wasn't it? Yeah, it's, I think it's pr in a way beautiful that something which was considered, I mean, what they did in medieval times was, you know, if someone was around who was poor, who had virtually nothing, there was always a bit of land for them, you know, so they could stick their cow there, they could put up a tent, or, you know, they could even put a makeshift shack or something together, uh, that there was, it was always considered important. Uh, it, in a way, we've still got a vestige of that. If you go to any parish church in, in England, uh, or, you know, it certainly anywhere in Britain pretty much, you'll find that the porch of the church is left open and that was considered to be a place where the poor could go and shelter in rain or whatever and there was always a, an idea that the state and the, the, the country, any kind of civilised nation would always provide for spaces for, places for people who are impoverished and poor and now of course we've got the total opposite of that in London with these homeless spikes being installed so that even if you want to try and shelter from the rain if you're totally destitute then you're going to have to sit on a bunch of spikes and of course you've got this hostile argument architecture. That's right, and uh, even uh, some councils now wanting to make rough sleeping illegal. Um, 
Yeah, making feeding the poor illegal, you know. This is, you know, we're starting to get into a sort of, basically, a, a police state style. Uh, although a lot of police, I don't think, would be happy with this way of doing things at all. A bit like the way a lot of journalists are not happy with reporting lies. Uh, you know, you, you've got a, an attempt to impose this kind of really draconian system, which is just based around money and nothing else, where money is your god. And uh, if you've got lots of money, then you've got a nice life. If you and, and anybody's life can be virtually switched off, literally by turning off their uh, benefits, by sanctioning them. I mean, I've got a friend here um, I've spent a bit of time today with. Uh, uh, she's a single mum with a two-year-old, uh, and two, three weeks ago, uh, she was just told, right, no more benefits. So we're switching them off. Uh, she can't pay the rent. She's now looking at staring at, in the face a situation of uh, being evicted with a, a single mum with a two-year-old child. You know, So that's the way things things seem to be heading here in Britain is that there there is a definite attempt to punish anybody with little money and also also imposing this whole idea through things like uh, you know large electricity bills massive rents so that you have to go out there and find vast amounts of money every month just to survive uh, it's the death of what we're witnessing is the death of what was called in uh, social science studies in the 1970s and 80s, which I undertook, the death of the Batskillite consensus. That was basically a consensus uh, the name Batskillite made up of Rab Butler, um, who never made, quite made it to the leader of the Tory party, but was arguably the most influential conservative thinker after the war, um, and Hugh Gateskill, former uh, Labour Party leader hence uh, Batskillite and that was basically as you said this idea shared by both parties both main parties that there would be a welfare state which meant that uh, nobody in Britain would ever have cause to be utterly destitute um, I think the, one of the other things, ways to look at this is that money, you know, for many years, uh, since, well, m since most of our lifetimes, uh, has been something which is there to sort of aid your you know, system, like you can use it to buy a car, easy means of exchange. But, I, you know, I constantly ask this question to myself, when did money stop being there to serve the population? When did it start being there to enslave the population? You know, that, that, in everybody's life, you reach a certain point where you're thinking, hang on a minute, uh, this debt or whatever it is whether it might be a mortgage or whether it is mean you, you know you can't pay the rent or it's a credit card is actually uh, you know it, it, it's destroying me you know it starts to eat into your life and really mess things up for you so I think that's another thing that's well, well worth it but you mentioned Hugh Gates School there and there's a, 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 a very interesting I think anyway interesting connection to uh, the Bilderbergs because he died a, a very early death very prematurely uh, as the leader of the Labour Party, uh, and he was actually at the first Bilderberg meeting in 1954. If you look at, there's a, a couple of photographs, one of the left-hand side and one of the right-hand side of the first Bilderberg meeting at the Bilderberg Hotel, being chaired by a young Prince Bernhard of the Netherlands, straight out from, you know, ten years after World War II. And there is Hugh Gateskill sitting at the back there, uh, and he looks very, uh, very... Um, should we say sceptical about the whole thing? You can see it, just look in his eyes if you say, hmm, I'm not quite sure about all this. Anyway, within a, a few years he was um, dead, you know, and I, and I think that there, are, there is a, quite a lot of evidence that he was either poisoned or helped to an early grave because he was very much, uh, you know, out of kilter with the uh, early Bilderberg consensus, uh, which was really there to divide Europe uh, from, or at least what's now the EU countries, Western Europe, from the Soviet Union. That's what it was there, to drive a wedge between the two. And that wasn't the over uh, agenda, but that was what they were really doing. And of course, Hugh Gateskill was one of the people that wanted closer relationships with the Soviet Union, close trade relationships, didn't really believe in the Cold War, and of course he didn't fit uh, the Bilderberg mould. Uh, somebody else who didn't fit the Bilderberg mould was his successor 40 years later, John Smith. Also attended shortly after becoming leader of the Labour Party, which he wasn't, unfortunately, for very long. Um, and uh, apparently he um, presented a paper on social justice, which was, of course, uh, you know, one of his... Uh, uh, his uh, main themes being an honest to God, social democrat, socialist, call it whatever you like. Um, he, funnily enough, wound up dead six months later, never became prime minister and was replaced instead by somebody called Tony Blair.
Yeah, I think the timing is interesting. I mean, it's very well worth looking at any of the papers, I think. That's probably a good job uh, for me once we've finished with our interview today. But the 1991 Bilderberg meeting, I'm pretty sure it was that one that John Smith was invited to. Right. And he was not at all impressed with the Bilderbergs. I mean, I've heard it anecdotally from somebody that was close to him that uh, he, he was kicking off basically at Bilderberg, you know, but, you know, saying that this is just the, your, your analysis of economics is all wrong. <laughs> um, you've got this wrong, you've got that wrong, you know, you're making all sorts of delusionary assumptions. Uh, and uh, that I want to, when I come back next year to Bilderberg, he told them, uh, bring, bring someone who's a really, you know, top-notch economics, e economist. I'm not sure if he was thinking about Brian Gould, uh, because Brian Gould was the deputy leader of the Labour Party at the time and absolutely one of the greatest economies in the world, economists at the world at the time. He's now, I think, over in New Zealand as a vice-chancellor of a university over there. Uh, but, uh, you know, his, his analysis would have absolutely torn the Bilderberg uh, so-called consensus to shreds. Uh, and, and, uh, and yeah, as you say, you know, he died, I think it was actually two years after um, he'd been to that building. He was never invited back to Bilderberg. And then I think it was 1993. I'm just I'm not absolutely sure of my dates, but uh, that, that Blair was invited back, and then immediately, pretty much, then uh, John Smith died, and Blair became leader of the Labour, Labour Party. I mean, you know, you could look at this cynically and say, well, Bilderberg just se selected Blair and bumped off John Smith. I mean, you know, that, uh, it's, it's impossible to know the details uh, of if if that's true, but it certainly seems to look that, that these people conveniently have. Uh, um, politicians uh, seem to rise to power who they favour and, and other politicians who they don't favour uh, seem to quite often go to an early grave. It's really unfortunate. And, of course, John Smith was brilliant at the dispatch box. He was extremely witty. Uh, he was very good in front of the camera, rather like uh, good old Robin Cook, another one who was really, really smart with the media and used to wipe the floor with the uh, sort of lies coming out of the United States when it came to the Iraq war, that kind of thing. Yes, so uh, um, Cook, of course, famously made that speech saying there is no other island, you know. Um, it's just the name of a database of what is the prizes. <laughs> so a few months later, he was dead, you know. <laughs> Yeah, so this is a whole other side to the Bilderberg meeting, which doesn't really get discussed much in the mainstream media. Uh, that uh, you know, there are all sorts of hints there about uh, the, the possibility that uh, uh, you know some of the some of the uh, uh, suspicious deaths. I mean, uh, about things like Diana, etc. Dr. David Kelly. There's enough of them. You know, it's not a shortage of these suspicious deaths in uh, high society politics. I mean, you know, essentially a political killing is an assassination. So that's what we're talking about here, potentially. Personally, I, d I don't see any reason why not. These people play for high stakes. You know, it's as simple as that. And uh, we always to naively believe that politics was basically a sort of level playing field. If you stood up, said the right things, a nice sort of chap, and, you know, made sense, then uh, you could get on. But uh, I've long since dispensed with such naive delusions. You know, it's a very, very dark and dirty business. And uh, power is not surrendered easily. I mean, in fact, per, you know, personally, I think the last half-decent Prime Minister we had in Britain was Jim Callaghan. Since then, they've all been puppet or stooges once or another. Well, I actually think Callaghan was brought in as an establishment stooge to replace Harold Wilson, who was uh, refusing to cooperate with the Americans over Vietnam. He was refusing to cooperate with the IMF uh, and all sorts of you know people he was ticking off and standing up for Britain. And, uh, and Callaghan actually had been involved in all sorts of secret stuff with the army to do with Northern Ireland. And uh, um, Callaghan, I I think I'm pretty sure it was the Home Secretary before he became Prime Minister. He was uh, he was not keeping the Cabinet and the Prime Minister and the confidential stuff around the Cabinet table because the military were uh, and the Home Office, etc., were putting pressure on him, saying, well, we think Harold Wilson is a Soviet agent, so you can't talk to him about this stuff at Cabinet, and, and, and Callaghan was going along with some of that. So, you know, there's the whole thing about the Wilson plot, the excellent book by Robin Ramsey, and, and, and there are a couple, I think, Stephen Dorrell, um, and there's another book as well, I think, on the Wilson plot. 
but the way that he was bounced out of power by the security services in this country, you know, and that, that should give us a pretty strong indication of what's going on when we find a, uh, one of the last prime ministers who was actually doing a good job for Britain generally in the world, standing up to the big boys in, you know, Europe, etc., um, could be just bounced out, effectively forced to resign. Uh, and I can even remember that as a child, thinking, getting a sort of sense, well, you know, what's going on here? I don't know how old I was, probably, uh, I don't know, about 10 or something, and, and, and thinking, so much wrong with this, it doesn't seem right, you know, and, and I think I was, I was right. Uh, I mean, get, just getting back to the Bilderbergs, which are just, they're all just heading off home now in their private jets and God knows what, um, I think it's it's really one of the things that's really struck me over the years is the the uh, air of of uh, control freakery and paranoia, actually almost like psychopathy that comes out of these builder But when you're actually there, you realise that you've got all these powerful people sort of sometimes even wandering out and going to their cars and things, and yet they're surrounded by this massive ring of private security and. Uh, it, you know, there's, you just get this whole feel. I mean, I did anyway. Of a whole feeling of it being a sort of cult. You know, you're not welcome here. It's a power cult, I think. And of course, it's a seductive very seductive thing for, for someone like Ed Balls to be phoned up, you know, a few weeks ago, when, whenever it would have been, after he's had an election defeat, you know, he's been kicked out even by his uh, constituents, uh, and, you know, no longer uh, la la Labour Party, no longer um, Shadow, uh, Shadow, uh, Shadow Chancellor. Uh, to be basically kicked into being a nobody by the electorate and going back to, you know, to be then phoned by the Bilderberg to say, Ed, we think it would be really wonderful if you came along to the Bilderberg. What he doesn't realise is, of course, that, that um, really the Bilderbergs just want him out of the way because as a, as a former Bilderberger, he's, the potential is he's going to be on the Andrew Neil show, the politics show, he's going to be all over the place talking about Bilderberg. So they can't allow that. They're very smart. You know, they don't want to... Uh, uh, see former Bilderbergers strolling around in the mainstream media, and so of course he, he he's just his vanity is played on, and he's brought in out of the media spotlight. And, and really, it does show where his loyalties lie. His loyalties lie to sort of the greasy pole, as you know, almost all of our major politicians nowadays, uh, and not to the public. And that gives a very clear message, I think, about Ed Balls and the types of people that they're schmoozing there. I thought he'd be looking for a job going there, to be honest. Now, so I've seen he'll be uh, closing up to these various CEOs and all this to it. And, uh, hoping to make that smooth transition like Blair before him from uh, elected office or the House of Commons to the corridors of international consultancy. Um, where you can line your own pockets for doing... Well, I mean, I think David Cameron is, you know, he's going to be walking straight out to a job with Goldman Sachs, isn't he? Uh, I mean, this is, this is what these Bilderberg conferences are largely about, isn't it? Making quiet promises. And I noticed James Corbett on the Corbett Report saying something which is just totally wrong. And I must, you know, I, don't, I, I love James's work, but he's got this completely wrong. He's saying, well, actually, Bilderberg could meet up on Skype and blah, 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 and they could have these kind of teleconferencing if they want. No, 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 you've just completely missed the point. The whole point is that they can make little promises like that at Bilderberg. They'll, they may say to a politician, well, look, you know, we've got this nice job for you. If you do this for us, well, you know. They can say that in a face-to-face -face meeting in a, in a, in a uh, hotel which is surrounded by security where they know that they're not being um, listened to because they've got, you know, they've got all this um, sort of defence ring, defensive ring around them. Um, and, and the main, you know, the main people they're keeping out of there, of course, are the journalists, and we've seen this time that's happened. But, uh, you know, really, you know, a kilometre away from the hotel, even the journalists, the, the protest, I think it was 10 miles away from the hotel, the protest, so they're, they're totally sealed off. And that is the reason that these people need to get together, because criminals do need privacy. Of course, they're not interested in privacy for anybody else. In fact, we are given no privacy. They want to be all over our uh, laptops and our uh, uh, emails uh, with their spyware, with their, you know, everything, you know, the, 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 they want to be right in our faces, you know, look looking at us through the tele screen with the uh, with the webcams etc but they are not in, they, I mean they they, have, they do actually have to meet physically because you know, they can't do the sorts of deals they want to do over email otherwise there's a criminal trail there that they could then be indicted for the whole uh, you scratch my back I'll scratch yours and uh, 
helping each other into advantageous positions reminds one of the Masons. Yeah, I mean, it's, I mean, it really is the bankers and the industrialists owning the politicians and giving them instructions. The politicians control our taxpayers' money, and that taxpayers' money pot is the thing I think that your corporate types, the, the fascists, um, people who want corporate control of all politics, uh, you know, through the media, through uh, parliamentary democratic politics, that's the thing they're most afraid of because, you know, some of that uh, tax spend might actually go on something which is useful for the people that they want to crush and enslave. So that's why the politicians have to be there, to be given instructions as to how they're going to spend our money. Uh, they're very, very worried, I think, that, you know, that some of that money might actually get spent on something useful. But, yeah, uh, Freemasonry He's very much been involved over the years, and I think, you know, they're, they're very good, the Masons, for example, at keeping uh, who is a Mason and who isn't quiet. I can tell you for an absolute cast iron fact, two people who were Freemasons, uh, are, uh, Bill Clinton, for example, is a Freemason. You won't find that on um, uh, Wikipedia, for example. Uh, I sort of I laugh when I say the word Wikipedia because, of course, we know it's uh, anything really important on there is just edited out almost immediately uh, by uh, people with money. Uh, you're talking about Bell, Bell Pottinger and the strategic communication firms that are paid to keep people's uh, certain things out of people's Wikipedia page. Ages. Um, but yeah, Bill Clinton, I've seen a picture of Bill Clinton and he's Masonic Regalia, so don't tell me he's not a Mason, please. And um, and the, the other the other person is King George VI from the Second World War. Uh, you know, he was our king right the way through the war. Uh, very little any evidence anywhere on, online or in any books. Of, uh, and so definitely King George VI was a Freemason. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, there's all sorts of things we could get into if you want to talk about World War II and what happened to the looted Nazi gold and dirty deals done between the British royal family, Mountbatten, Churchill, that lot, and the Nazis in the, you know, sort of late 1944 into 1945. They also definitely done. But um, there are there are two definite connections between Bilderberg and the Freemasons. One is the last meeting that, that took place uh, in Britain uh, before the Watford meeting back in 2013. Uh, that was up in Turnbury in Scotland. Which I visited just after the meeting had finished and spoke to some people who'd been working at the hotel. I spoke to the woman that served Tony Blair uh, his breakfast, even though he wasn't on the guest list. And, uh, uh, and, and Andrew Palmer organised that meeting. He was the main organiser of the meeting, did all the invites and this kind of thing, arranged the hotel. Andrew Palmer just happens to be the uh, former. Uh, personal private secretary to the Duke of Kent, the Queen's cousin, who's the Grand Master of World Freemasonry, well, the United Grand Lodge, which is considered to be by many the, you know, the sort of top echelons of Freemasonry, they're based in Covent Garden, and he's the boss whenever they have the meetings of, you know, thousands of Freemasons in their big gatherings that they have, which is rather sinister kind of religion, basically, it's a religious cult, Freemasonry. Uh, he's the chief, and it was his own guy that organised that meeting. The other thing is, if you go right back to the beginning of Bilderberg in 1954, that meeting was put together uh, by Prince Bernhard, the Nazi spy, the former SS officer who denied he was uh, a Nazi, but then uh, after his death, uh, the Dutch published evidence that he was actually in the Nazi party when he was studying at college as well as then joining the SS after that. Uh, Prince Bernhard um, chairing the meeting, but his, his right-hand man for doing the organising uh, was Joseph Rettin, a Polish um, Freemason, and he was working for MI6 during the war, looking after General Sikorsky, who's the uh, who died in a mysterious <laughs> plane crash off Gibraltar during the war. Um, one of the only trips he'd ever made without Rettinger by his side, and Rettinger was then the, then organising that. So you got a Freemason, definite Freemason, involved in right at the very beginning of Bilderberg in 1954, and then uh, actually organising these meetings. So I think it's pretty clear uh, these people are seen to be kind of trusted types that can keep their mouths shut. Yeah, so what Bilderberg is, in a sense, a sort of, you know, I don't think it has the same esoteric dimensions. It's also a pyramidal structure. I think everybody pays homage to Kissinger. I don't think David Rockefeller's there anymore. I think he's too old now, isn't he? But um, I think, you know, you've got sort of degrees of initiation into Bilderberg, as you say. Some people go once, their face doesn't fit, they don't go again. 
who find themselves dead a few years later, you know. Well, yeah, either that or, you know, sort of kicked out into the political wilderness, like someone like Will Hutton. I mean, he went, I'm not sure the year exactly, I think it's around about 2000, something like that, maybe the late, mid-late 90s. Will Hutton was the editor of the Observer newspaper at the time. Interesting that just this weekend, uh, the, the Observer has published what, could have just been written by Bilderberg themselves, most ridiculous uh, puff piece about, you know, oh, silly conspiracy theories. It, you know, it's actually written by MI6 or Bilderberg, that, you know, and, and the idea is to just make you think, oh, well, Bilderberg's something silly, and anyone that criticises it is, uh, you know. So that's what's happened to his newspaper, uh, because he wasn't on the Bilderberg programme. In fact, he wrote about it in The Observer, uh, calling the Bilderbergs the high priests of globalisation, and he said that the uh, the policy that they made there uh, and agreed on that there's that with their kind of fake consensus uh, is the forms the backdrop against which policy is made worldwide. I mean, he was being absolutely clear and telling the public what his view was, and then of course he was. Um, removed as editor of the Observer, uh, and he's doing some sort of charitable work. Um, but he certainly has no kind of real profile like he used to have, and he has very little, you know, power to decide what the public see and don't see in the Observer newspaper anymore. The Bilderbergs make sure of that. Yeah, they're pretty ruthless. So uh, yeah, but I mean, on the religious cult side with Freemasonry, I mean, it does look like a cult, doesn't it? If you're looking at the, the organisation itself, I think, uh, you know, first of all, cults are, I mean, how do you define a cult? Um, secrecy. It's got to have a very, very uh, strong message of secrecy to the people involved. There's got to be some kind of power involved in it, you know. So, uh, you know, you're keeping, you're playing your cards very close to your chest, um, and that's exactly the sort of thing I think that Bilderberg exhibits, which is this, you know, cult-like, you know, with the Masonic connections as well. Um, why, why wouldn't it be some part of a, a, a power cult, a money cult, um, and it also has connections with uh, with the, the whole banking, the very secretive now banking sector, which is, it seems to me, what they're doing is they're just keeping the secrecy for themselves, because much of what we're doing with our, for example, our banking now is online, and it's perfectly visible and viewable by people like GCHQ and the NSA, so the, the secrecy is only for them. The rest of us, literally, you know, the 99.99% have no secrecy and they have no privacy and they have all of it. And of course the move to the uh, cashless society. Uh, which I think was high on their agenda this year. Well, yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Peter, Peter Thiel is a really interesting character, I think, and we, we never see anything about him on the mainstream media, very, very rarely. But he's uh, financed a lot of these, I, what I call sort of second-tier uh, uh, NSA uh, security service, um, secret services, because the secret services first... Uh, tier was Microsoft, I think. You know that, what they did is that the CIA basically co-opted Bill Gates. Said to him, "We've got a nice little job for you here. Uh, we want you to roll this technology out across the world. You can make an absolute fortune at it, but we want a backdoor to everything." And so every operating system, pretty much, including the one I'm talking on now, is a Bill Gates operating system, a CIA operating system. And uh, in, in, uh, some of the best stuff I've read on 9/11 uh, is, is explains how the operating system was. Used used by hackers to get into the U.S. defense computers uh, so that they could just play around with the programs that were operating on them. I mean, may, people may have anti-spyware or whatever, or, you know, antivirus software. That is not actually able to see what's going on in the operating system. And so they wanted that, you know, that right originally. But now we're in the situation where people like Peter Thiel financing Facebook kind of everything we're doing. So pretty much whatever we do on the internet now is not only using uh, Bill Gates and his Microsoft uh, operating system, it's also uh, the major interface for us. So Google's a major interface with Gmail, with um, with the Google search and all the information they can garner about your mo innermost thoughts through looking at all your Google search terms and, and then market that or, or sell it to a political uh, organisation that might want to see if anybody is going to stop fracking or, you know, it really... It really 
really is pretty chilling what they can do with this uh, information they've got on us. And I'm, I'm talking about the, those groups are always been, over the years, over the last sort of 10 years or so, been invited. I'm talking about Twitter, I'm talking about LinkedIn, uh, and uh, yeah, Facebook, Google. Quite clearly, there's a, a real impetus by the Bilderbergs to co opt these people. And actually, these companies generally seem to be quite willing to be co opted by the NSA and GCHQ. And they're looking at a lot of their client base and thinking, well, uh, people are using Google and Gmail. They're not paying us. But uh, the real strong guys, the people who could possibly make trouble for us, are the security services, the, the signals intelligence services, GCHQ, NSA. And so uh, we're going to actually throw our lot in with them because, you know, and, and as long as we're quiet about it, hopefully no one will realise. And, and that is why the secrecy, I think, is so abhorrent, uh, is that you've got this kind of secret deal being done between the police state, Bilderberg, uh, the people that run uh, I'm not talking about everyone that works at GCHQ, of course, but the people that actually run it and uh, the, the more pernicious sides of it and, and, and the NSA and, and these tech companies um, because they want total what they call total information awareness, don't they? They want to know everything about us. They want us to know nothing about them. Uh, so they're a pretty sinister bunch, basically. I mean, look what would I mean, what would happen if Hitler had this sort of information available to his Gestapo? You know, he would have just been able to literally take out any kind of an opposition. You know, stick them in a concentration camp or worse. Uh, and that's why the Americans have their constitution because they they were annoyed about the British reading their post. Uh, and, uh, you know, intercepting their communications. That's one of the main reasons, as well as taxes, that the Constitution um, said that you've got to have uh, a warrant in order to, from a judge to show justification for putting anybody under surveillance. You can't do these mass data trawls. The same here in Britain. I mean, apparently it is, it is, I mean, it is actually a criminal offence to uh, uh, to uh, put somebody under surveillance without, without a warrant from a judge. It is here in Britain. The only trouble is, of course, that all the evidence that we would need to take GCHQ to court is secret. We can't walk into GCHQ and get that evidence very easily. Um, so, that, I, you know, this is a, this is a form of kind of technocracy of techno techno uh, tyranny. Where do you think they're going to go from here, Tony? Is, uh, is well, I, I certainly think uh, looking at the Middle East and Ukraine, that would have been a big topic at, um, at the Bilderberg this year, uh, with Henry Kissinger really, I suppose, him unfolding his plans it, it, to, to be dealing with private military companies, with mercenary companies, as he does. Uh, and I'm not sure if uh, uh, you know p people like... Uh, you know, Canadian Army Intelligence or British Army Intelligence are onto this, but you know, he really has already got a plan for these interventions around the world. Uh, quite what the tricks they're going to use to try and uh, take Syria, they're already trying very hard, um, you know, to convince people that British troops have got to go on the ground to take out ISIS in, in Syria and Iraq. Quite obviously, that's just an attempt to topple Assad regime change in Syria, Mark II, after the failed attempt to lie about the good a chemical weapons attack, which was actually carried out, it looks like, by the rebels and by, which is now ISIS, of course, and the Saudi, uh, sorry, the Turks, uh, Saudi's probably involved as well. And I mean, that's not just me, that's uh, that's the UN, Carla Del Ponte, the new UN report saying that. Uh, so there's a clear uh, agenda, it seems, but the, the pinnacle of the system that keeps that all running is this mainstream media, as Michel Chosodovsky was saying last week on, from Global Research, you know, that that it, with, with, without the mainstream media backing up these lies that we're being told, uh, you know, the whole lot would just tumble down. And on Ukraine, I mean, we've had um, uh, the, imp the movement of NATO eastwards and eastwards over the last 20, 30 years, uh, and now heavy weapons uh, tanks and things moving in closer and closer to the Russian border, and yet somehow uh, the ma mainstream media is painting this as Russian aggression. I mean, you just couldn't make it up. It's so Orwellian. It's unbelievable. What can we do? What's the way out of it? Well, I think number one is understanding what's going on. Uh, and, of course, that is happening, you know, not just through the Internet, but, uh, you know, people talking face-to-face -face about this. There's a lot of disillusion with, you know, I don't think there's very many people that would say we've actually got a functioning democracy here in Britain anymore. A lot of people here in Bristol, for example, uh, turned out within a week of the general election to have a massive, spontaneous anti-austerity march with something like 3,000 people 
gathering in the sun to really just sort of express their anger with the idea that there was any kind of point in austerity at all. I think, you know, the, 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 it's almost like the scales are starting to fall from people's eyes over who, whether we've got a democracy or not, uh, even though we vote, uh, you know, that it's actually largely the media that uh, tells us, and obviously, of course, the, the, you know, the main opposition party, the Labour Party at the top, it seems to be completely paralysed with either infiltrated or just they've been recruiting totally incompetent people because none of the main points that should be made during the uh, general election campaign were made, and they made a very half-hearted attempt uh, to, uh, to, to actually challenge the ridiculous agenda of, of austerity, which makes absolutely no sense. And, you know, even just a little bit of a discussion about challenging the financial system, you know, challenging the, uh, the monopoly of the banks, challenging the idea that... Um, Lloyds and RBS were in any way doing anything useful for the country, even though you know the Treasury owned most of the shares in them. Uh, you know, uh, we, we own this, these banks. We could be doing anything we want with them, but we're not. So we've got weak, uh, you know, people in in charge. Sell off RBS cheap now, you know. Yeah, they just sold it off with the 13. I mean, some of the newspapers, for some reason, were saying £7 billion pounds we've lost, but actually it's more like £13 billion if you look at the figures. Um, and this is massive amounts of money. This is all, all of the poor people who have had their benefits taken away, like my friend, for example, who's now threatened with eviction with a, a two-year-old son. It's more a court case in the early 1990s called the Blue Arrow Trial, uh, which Ian Fraser wrote about in his blog. Uh, he's an excellent financial journalist, one of the best in the country, actually. And he, he, he explained that what that happened with, during that Blue Arrow case was that some top blue bloods in this money cult, I mean, we're talking about the City of London here, you know, the mansion house types, yeah. they were uh, actually prosecuted and looked like they were going to go to jail. Uh, and the, the court case dragged on. I mean, what they'd done, basically, was a fraud. Fraud, 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 lots of it, and um, the the eventually after a couple of years in this trial, they got a these blue blood bankers got a uh, suspended sentence, and then they took had the cheek of the devil to take the uh, decision to the court of appeal, and they got the even the suspended sentence overturned, and, and at that day, a message went out right across. London, uh, particularly in Scotland Yard, etc., that there were going to be no more such prosecutions. And so we do have a formal uh, oligarchy now where there are uh, the people in this cult who are simply above the law. There's no way they're going to be prosecuted. Yes, it's a, it's a plutocracy. It's as simple as that, you know, government by the wealthy now, and it's quite barefaced. Yeah. yeah, and it's like a cult. Like I say, the closer to the centre of it you get, um, you'll be looked after. You know, it's it's pretty it's pretty scary when you think uh, that there was this what you call buscalite consensus. You're absolutely right, but you know, you've got ownership now. Seems to be. I mean, this is one of the things I, I've, I've picked up over the years is is the connections with the Nazis. We mentioned um, we mentioned Prince Bernhard earlier. You know, he was a, a Nazi at college, joined the SS, an officer in a motorised uh, division of the SS, and then he married into the Dutch royal family, and he was intimately you know, with, Bil with the Bilderberg, chaired the Bilderberg meeting for the first 20 years, from the mid-50s to the mid-70s, got caught um, taking a million dollar bribe from Lockheed, and then they had to sort of embarrassingly cancel the Bilderberg conference that year, or move it and do it secretly, I'm not quite sure which, but, but anyway, you know, and he was intimately involved in betraying Praying the uh, Operation Market Garden, the Bridge Too Far, which is a highly politically charged bit of history, actually, the, 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 the Arnhem Operation in September 1944, the Bridge Too Far film, but they, they wanted to take uh, these bridges that would give them a bridgehead over the Rhine at Arnhem. Now, this would have really screwed up the Nazis at the time because it would have meant that their, that their uh, supply lines would be cut, that the, that the British had a bridgehead into the Rhine, sorry, the Ruhr, uh, into the industrial heartland of Germany. They would have to move loads of troops around. It would really, it really would have messed them up if it had succeeded. And Bernhard was involved intimately in that. He was told by the Masonic king, uh, George VI, uh, the, the Ian Fleming was, you know, the Bond 
writer. And I think there's lots and lots of stuff in the Bond books which, you know, is, is very, very close to the truth uh, because Ian Fleming wanted to sort of send signals out after the war. Look, you know, there was some pretty nasty stuff that went on. Uh, Ian Fleming from Naval Intelligence uh, gave Bernhard his security clearance, but he was told to do that by both Churchill and by the, the King. So he didn't really have a lot of choice, but Bernhard got security clearance to be in on Operation Market Guard, and there are pictures of him peering over the shoulders of Montgomery. Uh, so he obviously knew what the plans were, and he sent a, a guy in who was supposed to, about a week before the battle, liaise with the Dutch resistance and make sure that the Dutch resistance were prepared for the biggest airborne invasion in history, and these paratroopers dropped in uh, 101st Airborne Division in Eindhoven, the 82nd Airborne Division in Nijmegen, and um, the British 1st Airborne Division at Arnhem. And that, that spy that he sent in to liaise turned out to be working for the Nazis. So, you know, it's pretty clear what Bernhard was up to. You know, he was involved in throwing that battle by sending someone in to betray it. And, um, and you know, there's lots of connections between the Nazis because the first meeting uh, took place in Oosterbeek and Oosterbeek was one of the key places in the Arnhem battle. Oosterbeek was um, where the British First Airborne was surrounded by the Nazis after the betrayal of... Uh, Bernhard, and uh, and also Lord Carrington, by the way, who was uh, he was at the Nijmegen Bridge um, and famously stopped when he could have gone down the road. We know now uh, there was nothing to stop him, but he, he and his uh, forces of the Grenadier Guards in their Sherman tanks just stopped uh, for 18 hours. Uh, he was 20 minutes away from linking up with the British Airborne at Arnhem, so he's also responsible for the massacre at Boosterbeek, and and uh, and it was in the same place exactly 10 years after that battle that the first Bilderberg meeting took place. So I, th I think it was a kind of bit of an in-joke, you know, that the, the Nazis with the friends in, in the West that they'd made because they really wanted to delay the war by another few months to give uh, Martin Bormann, uh, who was Hitler's secretary, Hitler's treasurer, basically, uh, time to get all the looted wealth of Europe, which they had, you know, systematically taken all the gold from all of the capitals that they'd taken uh, and squirrel it away for a nice little financial empire after World War II. Do you think Bor Bormann survived the war? Well, I mean, personally, I do, uh, absolutely. But you know, there's been a, a big, there's been. I mean, one of the just one of the examples of on this is there's a book called Op JB, Operation James Bond, written by uh, John Ainsworth Davis under the pen name Christopher Crichton, and in Op JB. What he says is, I was involved in the mission, secret mission, M section uh, of, of MI6, which was a totally private, basically owned by and run by the King and Churchill, again, uh, to snatch Borman at the end of the war. And uh, and when that book was being prepared, because he died last year, sadly, John Ainsworth Davis did, and, and he, he and it's well worth reading it because. When it came out, literally a few weeks before, there was a little big battle with publishers to actually get it printed. And when it finally came out, there was a, a, another book, uh, all about, supposedly anyway, saying how Martin Bormann definitely died uh, at the Hitler bunker, you know, and, and never survived the war, blah, blah, blah. This came out just a few weeks beforehand and got loads more publicity. So it was, you know, it seems pretty obvious to me. This was designed specifically as a cover and financed specifically to try and divert people's attention away from the publication of OPJB. And uh, th so that's a pretty strong indication. Um, uh, and the details in there are, 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 are pretty strong about who um, I mean, the mission that um, I mean the, the biggest evidence is that uh, John Ainsworth Davis has got signed letters by uh, Churchill, by uh, also by Lord Mountbatten um, to corroborate the story, saying, "Well, it's okay, you know, you can." Well, a lot of attempts anyway to pretend that Borman died. In fact, you know, most many of the pictures of Hitler you see now, you can see Borman hanging around in the background. He was the guy who had the the keys to all of the money boxes of the Nazi loot and. Uh, it doesn't surprise me that uh, there were some people, that ruthless types, that wanted to be friends with Bormann after the war. And, uh, and there's another book as well, which, which then goes into the details of what happened to Bormann uh, over in South America, in Argentina and in Paraguay. Uh, he, he was, what he was doing there was setting up 750 corporations around the world. Um, and Paul Manning's book, 
um, which is Martin Borman, the Nazi in Exile, again, at publication date, in the early, uh, it was 1982, his publisher had his um, legs broken, and his son, first son, was shot dead in New York, Paul Manning, when he was a, one of the CBS's greatest war correspondents on the radio in the States reporting the European war. Uh, when that book came out, you know, all, those, all that stuff happened, but these companies were set up using laundered money from the Nazi loot of the Second World War, uh, and they were populated, the boards were, and the directors were populated with um, former SS officers and SS sympathisers, um, and that to me, it looks very much like the kind of financial empire you know, controlling vast areas of our life today, you know, the, the, the handful of companies that control the world, grain supply, oil supply, all the basic things we need around the world, these big multinationals, food production, this kind of thing, um, seem to be the kind of modern successors of these, and they are functioning a bit like cults too, you know, very, very secretive, uh, you know, they only have people who uh, specifically, they know will keep their mouths shut on their boards uh, and they're, they're, we've created this monster, there's that great film isn't there the Canadian film, The Corporation it's called which uh, is it, it behaves legally like a living person except it's totally immortal, you know, these are the sorts of places that people now sort of want to gravitate towards but the rest of us I'm afraid uh, you know, we, we will just be left to starve, so yes I think Borman definitely survived the war, I think the evidence is very very strong that he was was very active in creating a kind of fourth Reich after World War Two. Uh, I just want to rewind to a, um, something else we touched on, Tony, before you go, uh, which is this uh, sort of, I mean, in a sense of all these cults and things going on at the moment, the one that everybody is being enslaved to is the cult of money. And um, what we've witnessed over the last 20 or 30 years is an increasing tendency towards commodification. In other words, putting a price on absolutely everything, except, of course, genuinely valuable things like healthy oceans or clean air to breathe, but all the social goods, um, as well, of course, as, as private goods that, are, that you, you kind of need for a, in, in today's society for a, a, a full life, um, have all been priced and, what's more, priced at ever higher levels. For example, uh, in Britain, after the war, you could be educated, healthcare, and to a lesser extent um, get around the country uh, on the transport system with little or no money. Um, increasingly, all these things, housing, you know, with the sell-off of the council houses, now that, you know, there's very little genuinely what one would call cheap or affordable housing around. Transport is enormously expensive. Um, it's, you know, gas and electricity to heat your home and keep the lights on is enormously expensive. So, Whereas 30 or 40 years ago, one could do quite a lot in life without money, now you can't do a single thing without it, and without quite a lot of it. Yeah, uh, I mean, yes, it's, I mean, it's, it's a sort of predatory government we're living under now. Uh, certainly uh, after World War II, it didn't really seem like that, uh, even though partly a government um, before the war was, you know, doing some pretty awful things. But, you know, imagine in the 1930s, we built these massive council estates, some of the biggest in the world. We were building like crazy in the 1930s. The government knew that unless it spent money on these big capital projects, that, that the economy was going to tank. And so, you know, there was... There was some um, actual real democracy going on. Nowadays, it, it just seems to me that the only kind of... Uh, the government seems to just do what it wants, and the only place that there's any kind of real democracy potentially is somewhere in the press. So they do what they want, but then occasionally something pops up on the TV or in one of the national newspapers which causes the government embarrassment and then causes them to do something. And that actually seems to me to be the way the country's being run these days. So you know, you've got big corporations, really, and business telling the government how to do things and owning the, owning the government. You know, it's, th These are the things over the years which the super-rich have wanted to co-opt to their um, own ends. And if you think about the... Uh, I mean, I'm talking about um, parliamentary democracy, that is, you know, parliaments, lawmakers that we elect, and the press, obviously, we, which we don't elect, but um, that, those are the two big threats that they've got.
got. And it was fascinating for me to see in the 1990s and the run-up to 2001 9-11 attacks, the way that uh, the British investigative journalism was just completely demolished over the space of a few years. In the early 1990s, we were producing some fantastic documentaries. Then there, was, uh, there were several very controversial ones. There was uh, Tim Tate from Yorkshire Television's film Conspiracy of Silence, which was uh, about uh, paedophile gangs uh, in the Republican Party in the United States uh, connected with uh, shipping young boys into Washington to be abused. That documentary was was uh, never shown, I don't think, even though... No, it wasn't. No, uh, it, it was uh, cost half a million dollars to make. Discovery Channel were pa paid, Yorkshire TV the money, but it was never actually ever shown. So that, that's the sort of thing we were starting to see. 1992, 1993, um, BBC did show Alan Frankovich's three-part series, uh, Operation Gladio, which was all about, uh, on the Time Watch strand, uh, which was all about NATO blowing people up all over Europe and then blaming it on the Russians. Um, and uh, then... Uh, there were several other. There was a murder in St. James, I think it was called, which was all about the fact that the Libyans didn't kill Yvonne Fletcher in, in London when they were supposed to have done by all the security services telling the media that they did and they didn't. And then there was the Lockerbie film. This kind of stuff around the early 90s was being made. It was like we had World in Action. We so uh, watched by 10 million viewers uh, when it was on a night, you know, so that was pulling in the advertising, but they can't make that anymore. And he, Roger Cook, even did a program about uh, at Boston Airport, you know, which is where the 9-11 hijackers got on the planes. Uh, it is showing how dreadful the security was there, for example, flagging up the problem, um, doing an extremely good job. He was, he was also um, uh, exposing arms dealers, exposed some arms dealers in Russia who were offering thermonuclear weapons, uh, SS-20 missiles on the black market, you know, because they hadn't been paid for months and they were getting a bit desperate for money. And so that was the sort of work, brilliant work, that people like Roger Cook were doing and other investigative journalists. And then, of course, just in time for 9-11, Rupert Murdoch's News of the World in 2000 uh, launched this series of week after week of smears in the News of the World about Roger Cook. And then the program was pulled by Central Television and uh, never came back again. So there was a definite attempt, pre-9-11, to take out any of the real good journalism that was going on on British television. Uh, and it succeeded, because when 9-11 then came along, we had even the BBC trotting out the, the Jane Stanley lies about, oh, look, the Building 7 has come down, uh, but actually it's there stood right behind her. So there was there's a definite attempt to co-opt and buy up the mainstream media, and the way to deal with that, I suppose, is to do alternative media like we're doing now, and also to, you know, to distribute the media around the country, not to concentrate it all in one place in London, which, uh, or in, you know, any of the capitals that we're talking about, because uh, it makes it far too easy for people to buy up control of what we see. I mean, the media really is our nervous system, you know, it's the nervous system of the world, the nation, and it's like, basically, people like Murdoch and the various Zionist influences on our press uh, are like sarin gas through that nervous system. System. It's just killing our ability to understand what's going on. So that's the main thing, I think. We've got to understand what's happening. Uh, and unless we do that, we have no idea how to act. Well, we're living in this uh, you know, totally fabricated paradigm with entirely false versions of the major events of the last 15 years, i.e. 9-11, 7-7 in the UK, uh, quite possibly Charlie Hebdo as well. And now we're... Oh, definitely. I mean, I think with 7-7, since you mentioned it, I mean, I was working for Greater London Radio in London on the IRA bombing campaign um, back in the early 1990s, and, and it was pretty clear to me that this was a real bombing campaign, so I was doing, you know, Basically, we, were the, we got the first bite of the cherry for those stories when those bombs went off at the stock exchange, etc. And uh, we were telling London what was going on, and we really uh, prided ourselves in making sure they they knew what was people knew what was happening, and were being told the truth. When the seven seven bombing 
it happened, I just felt, look, this is my patch, even though I hadn't worked there for whatever, 10 years or something. Uh, and uh, so I did a lot of work on, on, on 7-7. I'm quite convinced that it was uh, probably an outside power, either the US or the Israelis behind the uh, 7-7 attacks. There was a company called Verint Systems, which is a US, uh, sorry, Israeli-based actually software company who had access to all those tube tunnels and were doing work on uh, the CCTV software. Um, and the guy running that who had the uh, security pass was a guy called Daniel Bodner who was uh, in the, he was trained as an officer in the engineers as an explosives expert for the Israeli army. Well, what is he doing, you know, ha having access to the London Underground in the weeks running up to it? Um, you know, there's also the evidence with Peter Power and his terror drills being commissioned by Reed El Sevier, who are this big publisher, you know, very respected supposedly. That, but the thing is, they also were the people that organised the, um, uh, the, uh, 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 I think it's called the XL Arms Fair in Docklands every year. Um, so they're very, very close to these private military companies. And then for Peter Power then to come out and say, oh, this exercise was commissioned by them, well, you know, there's quite clearly a, uh, a Western hand behind the 7-7 bombings. And, of course, we haven't been told, but most of the relatives of the victims of 7-7 are absolutely livid about the way the government's dealt with them. Not only at the time did it not, tell people whether their loved ones had been found and were uh, in the mortuary, etc. It wouldn't tell them. I think it was for about three weeks. So this is big people are tearing their hair out. But then in the whole procedure afterwards, which took about uh, five or not, not five, I think it's about four years altogether to do the uh, the inquests into the 7-7 bombings. And, of course, it should have been a public inquiry. You don't do an inquest is for one person's suspicious death, not for 50 people's suspicious death. That's a public inquiry, quite clearly. What they wanted to do was to separate out all of the evidence so it was all heard one at a time, so that people couldn't... Uh, in fact, nobody could uh, put together a picture of what had really happened. Also... Uh, the coroner had no jury, dismissed the jury, didn't want a jury, which again is a you know, clear sign that there's something dodgy going on there. Uh, and the, if you talk to any of these relatives, uh, which I have done to some of them, it, you'll find that most of them are absolutely livid about the way they've been dealt with. Um, and yet none of that has actually been really told to the public. Uh, so they're still not really entirely sure what happened to their loved ones. They're just having to go on what the police have said. They've got no corroborating evidence. They haven't had a proper inquest, there's been no proper closure for most of them, and of course they were lied to massively by security services at the time when they were told that the so-called bombers, alleged bombers were clean skins, well we since found out that three of the four of them have been being followed very, very closely by MI5 rather like uh, Lee Rigby you know, the Woolwich uh, uh, the bombers uh, Adabawajo I think his name was, wasn't it? it was, he was actually deliberately released from Kenya uh, and brought over to Britain by the security services and uh, you know people Lee Rigby's family again absolutely livid about this sort of thing but this kind of stuff what they do is they say well let's just kind of let it let it let it go and let's not talk about it I think you need to talk about it if you're going to have any kind of real understanding about the way that the security services basically uh, are, are seeing British ordinary people around the country as the, a target for their political theatre that's the sort of you know murderous political theatre that they're doing in order to try and blame uh, the Muslims in a similar sort of way of course the Nazis were blaming the Jews in the 1930s I don't know if you remember at the time the excuse trotted out by a Labour ministers one after the other for the absence of a public inquiry when pressed was it would take resources away from combating terrorism. Yeah, Blair famously called it a ludicrous diversion, didn't he? And that's the title of a very good internet film which was made... It's and you know, others which aren't so interesting but you know that there's there is a very good campaign into into getting the truth out but I think that it's the Israeli connection which a lot of people seem to balk at and it's pretty clear to me that the Israelis were the senior se senior partners because Benjamin Netanyahu the president prime minister was uh, of course when he was in the army in Israel he was part of an assassination squad and now he's prime minister and uh, he was in London on the day of the 77 bombings as he was the Israeli finance minister and uh, he was reported by Associated Press in Jerusalem 
um, who'd phoned the Israeli um, diplomatic mission in London as they were over here, uh, and they told him, oh, well, we got it's OK, we got a warning beforehand. Well, hang on a minute, this was a surprise attack. How come Netanyahu got a warning? Um, and Scotland Yard, he, he said, oh, I got it from Scotland Yard. Uh, actually, no, uh, Scotland Yard then denied knowing anything about it. So you've got a very, you know, very clear finger pointing at the Israeli firm Berin Systems, uh, Daniel Bodner, who was their chief executive, um, and and also to Benjamin Netanyahu as having their fingers right in the middle of this. Uh, the other thing to mention about that is that the Verin company, their parent company, Converse Technologies, also involved in um, te- uh, phone phone, um, I think they were doing phone billing, that sort of thing. Uh, they, what they were doing was uh, 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 they, their chairman, Kobe Alexander, was on the run. He'd absconded with $13 million uh, from the company's stocks and he was uh, being chased by the Securities and Exchange Commission, the regulators of the stock exchange in the United States. So they've got Israeli mafia written all over them, these people, and of course they would uh, also agree the 7-7 bombings, the 9-11 attacks were great for Israel because uh, of the way it demonizes the Muslims and brings Western countries in behind intervention in the Middle East and attacking Muslim countries like the way that the way that um, uh, the way that Iraq and Syria and uh, e- e- even Egypt now although it's not direct intervention has been has been uh, devastated Libya has as well of course so this has all been exactly the yin on plan that the Israeli army has had going for decades now which is to balkanize the Middle East to really disrupt any kind of Arab opposition to Israeli expansionism. Yeah, two, two things. First of all, this has led directly to the biggest single crisis facing Europe at the moment, which is the migration situation. Um, you know, we've got people walking from Syria and Iraq to North Africa to get on boats. Half a million ready to sail again. Well, that's right. And, and I don't know if you noticed, but Newsweek last week had a great article about the guy who's behind it all. And if Newsweek can find out who's behind it all, it's a little bit like CNN going to interview Bin Laden, isn't it, at the time of the 9-11 attack? You know, if Newsweek can know who's organising it all, then you can be absolutely sure the intelligence services know exactly who it is. And, but the thing is, they're just doing nothing about it because it's part of the game. Yes, exactly. But you want to be very careful, Tony, when um, implicating Israel in the... Uh, 9-11 attacks, even though uh, a lot of work recently from people like Christopher Bolin and Barbara Honiger um, has done the same thing because that's extremism. Well, it's not, is it? Chris Bolin, actually, I know very well because I used to do the Bilderberg meetings with him in the early noughties. I was there with him in 2003 and, and in 2000. He was a photographer for American Free Press and uh, his work's been brilliant. But this this article, which has got Stephen Sizer banned, I think is one of the most brilliant in, you know, on 9-11 11. Uh, you know, I, I believe in freedom of speech, Charlie Hebdo style, actually. And uh, the uh, article is, is called 9-11, Israel did it, all the proof in the world is the actual title of the article. It's on Wikispooks, which was the actual... Um, particular version of that article which Reverend Stephen Sizer in Virginia Water pointed to on his Facebook page and then he was hauled in by the Bishop of Guildford and told you cannot uh, make any reference to this and he's been banned now from using social media he's not even allowed to talk about the Middle East incredibly enough he's still giving sermons I don't know how he managed to give a Church of England sermon on a Sunday in Virginia Water without mentioning the Middle East that's a bit of an awkward one uh, but but yeah I mean that's a, a superb article Wiki Spooks have done a really good job in actually getting the very best version of that article um, and all, all, all that's going on here is that people are not being intimidated um, by uh, the Zionist lobby, uh, as they are, you know, as they have done in the past when tyrannies have att- attempted to silence uh, the truth and silence opposition. Now, I'm not saying I subscribe to everything in that article, but it certainly should ring alarm bells for any intelligence officer um, reading through it. Well, actually, there's some pretty hard evidence here, and it's quite well referenced uh, and easy enough to, to check up on some of the facts which are talked about there. Um, I mean, particularly the Israeli mafia connections. Now, in a 
nobody is demonising Jews here. What we're saying is that the Mafia are using uh, Judaism and Israel as a cover, just as uh, corrupt and crooked people are using the British government as a cover, uh, a perfect cover in a way, you know, hiding in plain sight, just like the way that Jimmy Savile used the BBC as a cover. Um, and th it's important, therefore, that we have this you know, rule of law, that uh, there is no even hint of impunity. And that was obviously the, the sort of characteristic of Pinochet's Chile. But it's also, ever since the early 90s in the City of London, I mean, people who had the green light to do any kind of fraud, uh, uh, false accounting, um, mis-selling, they call it, don't they? Anything they want, if they can make money at it, that's London, uh, the city's unique selling point, is you can do anything here if you can get away with it. Well, this has been a terrific uh, segment, Tony. I can't thank you enough for coming on. I think we've uh, really put the world to rights this afternoon. Well, that's right. I think the thing is just getting your head around it and understanding it is the main thing. The thing to do, I suppose, is, is also uh, to disconnect from Babylon to a certain extent. I mean, I don't know if I can use the expression Babylon, but, uh, you know, to do, do as much as you can to... I mean, for example, one of the things we don't realise, in China, most of the people who are living in, uh, certainly in the countries, to a bit of a lesser extent in the cities too in China, don't pay rent. Yeah, that's quite, a, you know, people who, people who spend their whole life paying a mortgage just to get a kind of semi-detached house, which is the minimum they need to, st to stay sane, you know, m might actually raise a few eyebrows at that. And I think ultimately what this has been all about over the years is is really the oligarchy, the elite, the fascists, who've got monopolised power, uh, big corporations, I mean, whatever, even nowadays, of course, uh, much of our national infrastructure has been privatised and sold off. And, and all upcoming as well. I mean, the present lockdown on selling off absolutely everything. Communist ideology or socialist ideology that might say, well, actually, some of this should be for the people. That's what they're really afraid of, and they'll do everything to demonise the left, generally, or, or anyone that challenges them on that. Uh, and so, it's a form of feudalism. We're back to a kind of. I mean, look at. Isn't it fascinating to see? You know, in the United States, for example, we've got the Clinton dynasty. You know, it's just like a, a monarchy, really, and, and the Bush dynasty. There's really no semblance of. I mean, even here in Britain, they're talking about Yvette Cooper and Ed balls, you know, being the kind of are you telling me that one couple are the only people that can be the, the national opposition? I mean, this is just, we're getting beyond the, you know, the two Miliband brothers, for example. Keep it in the family. This is not democracy. This is feudalism of various different sorts. And although there are people behind the scenes, that, you know, running this kind of things, like the Bilderbergs, very important in all of this, of course, is the uh, City of London and Wall Street. And uh, equally important is the Royal Institute for International Affairs. That's uh, Chatham House in London which basically is a private club that runs foreign policy for the Foreign Office and has got a much bigger budget um, in terms of communications and that sort of thing and influence. And the same in the United States as the Council on Foreign Relations, um, which are basically running US foreign policy. So you've got these shadow organisations, like, almost like the ivy on the tree that's slowly strangling the tree and, and, and you can hear the tree creaking in the wind and at some point it's going to go over. I think we've entered an era of the heaviest news management um, of all time, really. I mean, we sometimes get a slightly nuanced story in The Independent or The Guardian, but when it comes to television news, whether it's the BBC, ITV or Sky, they do the same stories in the same order with the same spin on them. You know, there's very, very little variation. As you said, we've lost investigative journalism a long time ago. Last of it disappeared out the window about 15 years ago, apart from what you can find online. Um, what remains of investigative journalism has been reclassified classified as conspiracy theory or, you know, muckraking, generally denigrated. Well, that's, yes, that's a weaponized term. I mean, this term was developed in order to try and, you know, there was a clear understanding that, you know, people might investigate the criminal elite and that we had to have a term which would, you know, everyone would know was the, the sign. And, you know, that was done by basically getting uh, useful idiots to peddle silly conspiracy theories about lizards and this kind of thing. Uh, and then it was easy to use that term as a kind of cosh to stop anyone actually thinking about it. Uh, so, you know, that's, that's the world we're living in. But I don't think it's all totally dark by any means, because I think there's quite a big... Re you know, I was hearing uh, the other day, just from a friend of mine who was in, uh, in Munich a few years ago, that uh, there was some kind of anarchist thing going on, a protest, and that everybody in Munich had 
staying in their homes and that kind of thing, but you won't get that in Britain. And I was really impressed by the turnout at the Bilderberg Conference in 2013 here in the UK. Uh, Charlie Skelton, uh, you know, he's done his Builder blog in the Gar- for the Guardian and been counted by this observer guy. You know, it's almost like the, the, the war, war zone is the Guardian website, you know, for the for, for covering Bilderberg. Uh, yeah, Charlie had done quite a lot of work on that uh, in years gone by. And, you know, that there... I'm sorry, I've just... Uh, what was I? What was I saying? Can you remember? Just lost my thread for a second there. Sorry. So uh, the the Guardian being the um, the uh, front line and um, Charlie, uh, what's his name? You know, reporting. Charlie Skelton about being a bit of a battleground. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. I think I think that's uh, they're, yeah they've, they've done a very very good job actually. I mean, a lot of people might say, well, he's been pulling his punches. Actually, he's writing for a mainstream audience. He's done a really really good job of it. And he's also been hassled and harassed by the by the cops over at the Bilderberg. Um, but uh, there's been absolutely yeah. nothing in the mainstream media about. That. No, no. Uh, yeah, it's it's pretty it's pretty chilling. Uh, but but you know there there are there are some good signs over in Britain. I mean, as I was talking about the conference Bilderberg at Watford in 2013, Charlie pointed out that uh, more people were turned away. About two and a half thousand people were turned away from that conference because the, the protest site reached capacity with about three thousand people in there. Uh, they had ever ever turned up at a builder boat conference at all in the past. So in Britain here, we we do have something special. Whatever it is, I don't know. We've got a kind of anti-Nazi spirit, perhaps the, the memory of our grandparents in the Blitz, um, a tradition of satire, which and comedy, and poking fun at our leaders and not really believing in them. Um, uh, this kind of thing, which actually I think is going to uh, rule the day in the end. I mean, it's going to be tough when they take away our food, when they decide they want to have a war with China and Russia. You know, this is going to be difficult, very tough. Um, and people may lose their jobs unless they tow the line. It's going to be a kind of slavery. But I think there's definitely a spirit of resistance here, which is almost as strong, if not stronger, than anywhere else in the world. And the reason, you know, as I've talked about, you know, with the spirit of after World War Two, was because we did have a brilliant education system in this country post-war. Absolutely fantastic. You know, after World War II there's a very, very educated population and in a way I think that Atlee government, that was the most wonderful thing they did for the nation was to make sure we've got a well-educated population people that that don't take the bullshit and are prepared to put up with the lies. The other thing, of course, we've got, which they hate, is things like Al Jazeera and Russia Today, which give different perspectives from the official line, because they have absolutely decided that they are going to lie to us through the mainstream media, and that is their trump card, supposedly. But actually, with these other sorts of media that we can get, including the alternative media, like, like 21st Century Wire and you know the other, the, all these other kind of uh, alternative media, as Michelle Chosodovsky's global research website, uh, it is actually impossible, I think, for them to totally control. All they can do is they can they can have loads of uh, credulous people watching their propaganda. Uh, unfortunately, they believe their own propaganda sometimes and, and uh, they think that it's worth watching. A lot of young people I know never watch television. They know, have no interest in it and don't believe it at all. So, you know, we've got actually, I think, a pretty amazing spirit going here in Britain, uh, which is going to be their undoing. Yeah, I mean, of course, they want to emasculate the education system and increasingly orientate it towards jobs, basically. Um, you know, arts education is under remorseless and relentless attack, um, as is any kind of critical thinking, you know. So, yeah, but you see, as they, as they start going for us, you know, maybe in the past years with things like the Iraq war, people were uh, thinking, well, this is all a long way away. Now it's coming very, very close to home. What the Conservatives are effectively doing now is they are forming a resistance right across Britain to to the government and uh, they only succeed if it's got the confidence of the people once the, 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 they are you know, increasingly seen as illegitimate. Uh, actually, they, they find that they can't actually govern. They can't do what they want anymore. I hope you're right, Tony. I hope you're right. I mean, one of the... Th- oh, well, I think I am, because, you know, the, yeah, I mean, y- once a government starts to lie, over-lie and lie again, uh, then even their own civil servants find ways of dropping bits of paper in paper baskets and shredding things that are supposed to be implemented. And, you know, and we also, of course, we've got, we've got George Orwell, bless him, and all of his writings, particularly in 1984, as part of our culture, and there's no way they can scrub that out. 
No, you're absolutely right. I mean, they have tried to redefine democracy as being solely the plebiscite every five years. You know. It's almost like, you know, but it's almost like George was, you know, saying, look, guys, this is going to happen, and when it does, you know, I mean, of course, we are Huxley in his brave new world as well, and there was a whole tradition of uh, that after after World War Two. I think that partly came with this understanding that the Brits had done a deal with the Nazis, and the, the Americans had done a deal, done deals with the Nazis, and particularly for their enriched uranium in 1944 and and got that out, you know that that was the dirty deal with the money the gold the Nazi gold and the Nazi uranium uh, and uh, that understanding I think kicked off a whole kind of uh, you know literary tradition to say well look hang on guys this is going to be just a minute before I go also another important uh, read if people are interested in, is the proofs for a conspiracy against all religions and governments and this was the Illuminati text written by John Robeson back in the late 1700s yeah. and he, he there really explains how Freemasonry uh, as a cult was going to infiltrate uh, religions because that's the way to control people's hearts and governments and political parties because that's a way to control people's minds and he saw it back in the late 1700s super guy great writer uh, john robison r-o-b-i-s-o-n um and he was a great yeah super guy and a great writer and you'll find his stuff for free on the internet but a brilliant way of explaining how this massive cult which includes sort of pops up things like the nazis and other cults the freemasons etc uh, was intending to take over the world really by uh, uh, by putting uh, pliable people into positions of power by blackmail we've seen that through the uh, child sexual abuse scandal that's quite clearly been used for political blackmail and uh, i think that's the kind of world we're living with it's actually a very fragile it's a bit like saudi arabia you know you've got a handful of people in power but if they were to for example send the yemeni troops uh it, it, it send the saudi troops into yemen everything would fall down because most of the saudi troops are actually yemenis and they couldn't rely on them anymore and they would then probably just depose the saudi government if or Saudi King, you know, if they, if they were to do that. So they're actually on a bit of a sticky wicket, and it's very fragile what they're playing with, and, and at some point it's going to crack. Yep, let's hope it's sooner rather than later. <laughs> All right, yeah, nice to talk to you, Basil. Uh, just, just if I can just mention my program, which is online at thisweek.org.uk. We do live every Friday here in Bristol on the radio. Yeah, oh, sorry, I was going to say, do you want to give a plug for anything else? What are you up to? And the Bilderberg website, which has got all sorts of uh, documents I dredged up from the Bodleian Library back in the 90s about the origins of Bilderberg, and that's uh, bilderberg.org. Uh, as well as I also get involved with running and moderating the 9-11 Truth website, which is a co kind of current affairs, all sorts of stuff on there, which is 9-11 forum.org.uk so the three main sites this week.org.uk for the radio show 911forum.org.uk for a kind of news discussion and background on all sorts of different subjects and finally good old builderberg.org brilliant it's been great to have you Tony and I hope you come back and join us again soon lovely thank you very much for uh, having me on cheers yeah. bye thanks a lot Tony expressed on this program by its guests do not necessarily reflect the views or beliefs of the host or radio network. This program's sole intent is to help educate, foster critical debate, 